Thank you again for allowing me to participate in strengthening your relationships. You know, in this session, we cover the four most important elements of any healthy relationship. Now, it's very important for me to share that it's not a matter of practicing these elements like once in a while. For example, take the area of meaningful communication. We just can't say, well, I'm going to talk to my wife on Monday and then not talk to her again until Thursday. And when she complains, say, hey, I talked to you on Monday. What's the problem? I found that we have to work on these four areas every day if we want the best relationship. A good way to know where we stand in these areas is to ask each other, like example, zero to ten, zero rotten, ten the best, where is our relationship in this area of communication? And then, what would it take to move that area up to a ten? Now, if you work on these areas and put them into practice, you're going to see improvements in your relationship. So let's get right into this session. Thank you very much. This session, we're going to get into why men are so valuable. Males have the capacity to make a decision to really um, do the things that are one of the things I love about men, and I find it everywhere I go. You give a man a plan on what it takes to build a good relationship, and if he has confidence in the person or confidence in the plan, he'll do the plan no matter how he's feeling, and watch the results start to take place. It's one of our strengths because it's a decision. It's something we're going to conquer. We think, hey, I'll do that kind of thing. In fact, um, do you hear about the guy who did this very thing? He went to a marriage seminar. He, he got a marriage book, and he got a group of his uh, buddies together. They met every Friday at noon, and they went over this marriage book together for an hour while they ate their lunch because he said, we can conquer this. We can do this. We can get a better marriage. And they were doing that. They were working on it. And they got to this section of the book that talks about how women appreciate uh, flowers and why they do and cards and, and what it communicates to a woman and the different communication that it has with a man. And so this guy finished it and he says, I could do that. Hey. So he'd never done this before. He left work early that day. On his way home, he bought flowers, a card, candy, wrote a bunch of neat things on it. He'd never done this before. He has them behind him. He knocks on the door. He's home early now. Uh, she answers the door, you know. And uh, he puts them out in front of him, and he says, Hi, honey. He says, I love you so much. And she breaks down and starts sobbing. And he's thinking, wait a minute. I just read how encouraging this kind of thing is to a woman. So he says, what's wrong with you? She says, honey, everything's gone wrong today. She says, the baby's been grouchy and messy all day. She says, the dishwasher clogged up, flowed all over the carpet. And now you come home drunk. <laughs> now, why is that even funny? That's because men usually do not make decisions to do things like that unless there's something's wrong. In fact, a woman will say, what do you do? Or what do you want? Or whatever. You see, we're in suspects. You see, the average guy doesn't think about uh, cards and, you know, we don't always remember anniversaries. And those kind of things. In fact, the average guy can pick up Christmas and Valentine's Day, of course, because of all the signs all over town. But... Uh, <laughs> You can take the anniversary. See, it's more difficult for us to remember that because, you know, you don't have a sign out in front of your house saying 29 more shopping days until our anniversary. <laughs> we need a lot of reminders. And it's very honoring for you to remind your husband things, saying, I understand how much you value me. And I do, re I do, I do you know, recall that it might be difficult for you to remember this or our anniversary is tomorrow morning. Those kinds of things. <laughs> Instead of giving us the card as we wake up in the morning because we don't have anything. And well, that's when one of the quick convenient shops, we go down there as soon as we can. But if you help us to remember, that's part of the honoring. In fact, I love it when I do some things around the home where I know it's, where I find out it's not really relational. And Norma is not hurt because she knows that I didn't do it intentionally. See, the problem with a lot of women is they think their husband lies in bed at night thinking up ways of straining the marriage. I tell women everywhere, that isn't true. Those things just come natural to us. We don't think that stuff up. Because left brain stuff is not thinking of relational stuff. We can make a decision to be right brain. And that's a lot of what this conference is all about. Learning to become more right brain in our relationship. It enriches everything. 
enriches our home, makes us healthier, and we'll, we'll uh, uh, review that from time to time because that's an extremely important point. So one of the great strengths of a man is that we make a decision when we have a plan. One of the great strengths of a woman, she has a natural desire to have a good relationship. You either give that to a woman for the first 10 years of your marriage or she'll start crawling the wall. She may not know why. It's the basis of a book, in fact, uh, that talks about how men tend to be passive in building relationships. And women can... I find that women develop what I call relational scurvy. It's just like denying vitamin C if you don't give rich relationship, a meaningful relationship. She doesn't know exactly why she's feeling this way. He doesn't understand it. She's trying to explain it with female language. He's hearing it as a male. And the, he's decoding it as a male language. He doesn't understand. He's, and a lot of times this conversation ends and we go on being the way we, we have been. And more of the same does not bring change. Understanding what's taking place and making a decision. We want a better marriage. We want a better relationship. We want a better parenting relationship. You can make that decision and start it off with, oh, because it starts here. Oh, you can just stamp that right on anybody's head that you want to start developing a meaningful relationship. Stradivarius. Second, as a woman, you can look at your husband and go, oh. In fact, wouldn't it be unique if when you did get together at night and a, and a woman... And, and maybe the when, maybe the wife gets home first or whatever. You have your children. A man comes home, and he opens the door, and everybody's on the other side of the door, going, "Oh!" <gasps> He'll probably look, you know, around, wondering what's going on. Have the kids throwing rose petals. <laughs> Big fan. Oh! <gasps> Unbelievable! This guy actually lives here. <laughs> the honor, tremendous. So we want to honor men in this session. Oh! <gasps> Now, that's really what this session is all about. This is a session that, that we could entitle Loving Our Mate. Uh, and this is one of the strengths of a male, incidentally. I know you're wondering what this is. It'll make sense in a few moments. This is one of the great strengths of a man. He can actually get a plan, and you say, now, what if, what, this is some kind of an IV plant here. And so uh, we'll say that if we have to keep this IV uh, around our house, then uh, we have to do certain things. We have to know what kind of um, and how much sunlight this thing needs, either indirect or direct or whatever. And, uh, and whoever had this plant, I, I don't know the owner, but they, they, they have some lacking in knowledge and skills here uh, <laughs> in, a few, in a few ways. Now, they may have left it where there wasn't enough sunlight. So you have to have the right kind of sunlight, and whether it's south you know, side of the house or whatever, and I don't know. Uh, but then you also have to know how much water it takes. And it feels a little bit damp down here, but I, I mean, I don't, maybe they haven't watered it in six months. And just because they knew it was going to be on television, they decided to water it and see if they could perk it up a little. And they did perk it a little. But basically, it was in big, big trouble. So we could basically say that the people who own this plant really do not know how to love this plant. Because love requires knowledge of what it takes to love something and skill in using that knowledge. You can have a lot of knowledge, but you may not have any skill. So I, you have to know how to trim this stuff. And uh, then, then also, we know that it needs soil. So there it is. We have soil down here. And we know that it needs air. Now, those are the basic four things that this thing needs. Let's pretend, and we really have to stretch our mind a lot. And here's a bow, so we could say this is a female plant. And, uh, and let's just call her Ivy, OK? <laughs> and I haven't known her very long, just met her recently. And, uh, but let's say that it was possible to do this, but let's say I could fall in love with a plant. And let's say that we actually could get married, okay? Hypothetical, obviously. So, um, so we've, we've only been dating for a short time, and I say, you know, Ivy, kind of special to me. I really, I, I'm into Ivy. And uh, I do kind of appreciate you, and you know, what do you think about us uh, spending the rest of our life together? She says, yeah, it'd be a great idea. So let's pretend we're at a, uh, you know, a wedding here, and uh, I'm marrying Ivy. So, I, they, you know, do I take Ivy to be my, you know, a partner for the rest of my life, you know, I committed to her, yes, uh, for better or for worse, and so on, you know, yes, I take you, Ivy. And she takes me as her lover in the truest sense of the word. So now we're married. Now, to some degree, we're sort of uh, blind before we marry. There's a degree of we don't see everything. And then after you're living with somebody for a couple of weeks and, you know, a month, and after the honeymoon and all this stuff, you start noticing stuff. 
So I, I'm with her, and I've been around her enough, and I start really looking. I look a little bit off to the side, and left side of my brain starts noticing some things. And I say, I say to myself, Ivy, you know, you got some real problems here. Uh, <laughs> and I have the desire just to rip some of them off, you know, because they're really unattractive. Now, this is a very fascinating phenomena, but this is very true in marriages and in parenting and friendships and in work and so on. Most of the time, the very things that bug us about people are things that were helped to put there by other people. This woman that I dated and married uh, in, with a short engagement, uh, her, she could have been treated very poorly by her father. Do you know that women who are treated in a dishonoring way by their father, it's harder for them to respond to their husband in a loving relationship? There's some degree of blockings there unless they get that healed. Uh, a woman who was criticized a great deal by her parents or a person who was put down at school or just people who was, maybe a person was teased a lot or whatever. When you marry that person, you marry the whole history of that person. So we may get into a marriage with a, with a pretty browned out situation here. Now, real love is fact finding. We actually look over the situation and say, what are the facts here? What's going to take to have a good relationship? Obviously, we've got to do something different than what Ivy's been going through. Now, if, and I don't want to go over and grab her dad and you know, beat him up kind of thing, because that doesn't solve Ivy's problem at all. So what I can do is find out what is wrong with Ivy. What's the problem? Why is she so critical? I could say this. I could say, Ivy, this really bugs me. You are so critical. You, you, you're irresponsible in your spending habits, you know, kind of thing. And, and besides the fact you snore at night, you know, and you <laughs> grind your teeth, you seem to be uptight, you're not at peace. You know, I mean, there's a lot of problems in your life. Would you get your life together? I don't know how much longer I can live like this. This stuff is getting to me. I can respond that way, but that's not love. Love is saying, Ivy, what do you need? And that's the great strength of a male. Left side of the brain. What do you need? What do we need? What's this marriage need? What's this family need? And I start looking at it, and I find out, how's her soil? And how's the, how's the water level? And how much water does she need? And what about the sunlight and all of that? I look it over. And then after I find out the knowledge and the skills of taking care of Ivy, then I could have a blue ribbon plant. But I can't have that until I learn that. And I am finding, and I can hardly wait to see more and more of this, men saying, what's it take? Give us a plan. And women, because everything I say that a man can do, a woman can do. Somebody needs to start it. Same thing with our children. Somebody needs to say, what does this take? So what does it take? It's exactly the same type of thing in our marriage. I'm a fact finder, left side of my brain. I get off away from my wife and kids and say, what's needed here? And I begin to learn from other people of the sources of the books, getting counseling, whatever I need to get the answers to what my family needs. And then I get a chance to provide that on the left side of my brain as a conquering experience. And I say, let's go for it. Let's go for the best. Let's go for a relationship that's nine or ten. Let's don't go into the threes and fours and sixes kinds of things. I want the best. And I want to see our nation in the best. And I want to see families and marriages all across the world get stronger and stronger and know that there is hope instead of floundering around wondering, is this thing ever going to work out? I have seen so many couples that basically ready to divorce and stop their divorce and be able to get back into love because they discovered some things about themselves. We have an instrument that we're going to give and I, I get to be involved in that in our nation that not only shows the strengths of each individual in your home, but shows what they need and what their values are. And we'll be able to give that one of these days so that we just keep adding more and more things to whatever it takes to have strong families and marriages. That's exactly what I want to see happen. So what do we do for our average home? What, what does the average couple have to do? What does it take? There's four things that I think every marriage... I believe that every marriage needs, and I, when I find one of those elements missing of the four, I see a weaker relationship. And it's not that you're going to have three of them and forget the fourth one. You've got to have all of them to some degree. I mean, you may not be at a 10 in all of these, but you've got to have some of it there. And I say we can be working on it and watch how your marriage begins to green out and flower out as you're working on these four areas. Area number one, just like sunlight to ivy, is the whole area of... Security. Security. 
Security is knowing that somebody is committed to me and that I'm committed to that person for life. And I say to the person I'm committed for life because the more insecurity, the more problems you're going to have. In fact, you're going to have a lot of arguments in your home where you're saying, where are these arguments coming from? Why are we fighting about all these insignificant things? I'll tell you why you're fighting about insignificant things. Somebody feels insecure. We don't deal with the issue of insecurity. We're dealing with the symptoms of insecurity, which never solve the true problem. The more secure your marriage, the more sunlight is flooding your life and your, and your home. Security means telling your mate, I'm committed for life. Whatever it takes, we're going to learn and solve this thing and stay together and have a better marriage. Watch it happen. Whatever it takes in our home with our kids, that's security. Because everybody's going to go through tough times. I go through tough times. You are. Every relationship is going to be strained out. My marriage is strained out from time to time. My marriage is strained out 10% of the time, let's say. It used to be strained out a lot more. 90% of the time in my home with my wife and kids, we're in harmony. But I go through those same kinds of things you do, and it never used to be that way. It's a lot more strain. But the more I understand, the more I work on it, the greater it gets, and the more consistent harmony we can have on a regular basis. So I know it's possible, so the first thing we give is security. I have a plaque in the entryway of my home. It says to Norma, Carrie, Greg, and Mike, an assurance of my lifetime commitment, Christmas 1976. There's not a week that goes by that I don't tell my, some, every member of my family how much I love them. When I'm, when I'm away from the home, I call and say, I love you. I conclude the conversation with, I love you. And I'll say, ah, oh, right over the phone, I am married to the most awesome person. I cannot believe it. <laughs> and, you know, she'll say, oh, you know, whatever. <laughs> and she'll say the same to me. She'll say, I'm committed to you. And we don't say it every day kind of thing in the commitment, but we say it enough in different ways. Flowers and a, and a piece of jewelry and those kinds of things say, I was thinking about you, I'm committed. That's why it's so special. But there's a lot of insecurity in this world and there are a lot of problems because of it. And there are a lot of single people that have insecurity too at the same time because there's nobody committed to them. They don't know who loves me. That's why it's so difficult many times to remain single. Who really is committed to me? And everything we read today in the romance uh, magazine articles is what, what does a woman want? Somebody to commit themselves. I do that. And now I see the results. Did you hear about the woman who wasn't married? She's about 26 years old. Couldn't keep a man. Dated a lot of guys. Fairly attractive, but could not keep them because she had the worst case of breath odor of anyone she knew. She tried sprays, you know, all the things you tried, going to the doctor, everything else, something with her stomach. When she'd get real close to a guy she was dating, he'd go, ooh, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, and he wouldn't ask her out again. So she made it of her mind that if she ever met, you know, Mr. Wonderful, she was not going to open her mouth close to him. And if he ever kissed her, she was going to tighten her lips up so he wouldn't sense anything. That very thing happened. She met this neat guy, and they did, you know, you know they'd hug and kiss, you know, kind of thing. And, she, and he thought, that's different. Maybe if we ever did get married, I could talk to her about it later on, you know, kind of thing. But she was kind of a romantic kind of a person, so she'd always want to take walks, you know, take their shoes off and go by the water or by the beach or river or whatever. But he would never take his shoes off because he had the worst case of foot odor of anyone he knew. And he wasn't about to lose her because he really liked her. He tried odor eater spray, you know, everything. Nothing worked on him, okay? They literally date for three years and they never discern this about one another, and they marry. They're on their honeymoon. She's in the bathroom crying because she knows she has to face him. He's out in the bedroom trying to figure out what to do with his shoes. <laughs> He's trying to hide them. So she finally lights her off. She comes out of the bathroom. She gets under the covers. She faces him now for the first time. And she says, honey, I have a confession to make. And he says, let me guess. You ate my socks. <laughs> now, now, you know, that's... That's extreme insecurity. Now, the problem with that, and it's a good story in the sense that uh, it does illustrate insecurity, but it also illustrates one other thing that's real important in the area of security. That is, anytime we put conditions on our security and love, you build insecurity immediately. If you say to a person, you know, I'll love you if, if you get your leaves shaped up, then I'll love you. See, real love is a commitment to care for someone, whatever condition they're in, and I commit myself to find out why they're that way, and I'm only married to this person the rest of my life, so I've got tons of time to find out what it is. And it's not in a condemning way. 
like, oh, it would be so much easier to live with you if you were, you know, halfway decent to live with, kind of. See, that just discourages and makes more insecurity. I say whatever it takes in my home, then that's what I want to do to build security, for sure. That's the first area. Second area. Now, this whole thing is built on honor. So we go, oh, I'm going to give four things to this person I'm married to for life. Second area, meaningful communication. Try having a good marriage, something close to 10, without meaningful communication. It doesn't work out. Guess who are the conversationalists in the home? The woman, not the man. A man has to make a decision, the average man, has to make a decision to have meaningful communication. What is meaningful communication? I don't know. I'm learning what it is over and over again. And different, there's so many courses you can take on it. There's books you can read on it. There's a number of things you can do with it. We've written an, uh, our latest book. It's all it's on is, is meaningful communication. Here's what I'm told it means. It means sharing my feelings. It means talking about ordinary things that happen around the house. It, it means talking about Christmas in August. And I never used to understand why we talked about Christmas in August because I used to shop on the 24th. And, uh, and yet I never realized how important that is. You know that the average woman gets more enjoyment in talking and planning about events coming than actually the event themselves? Vacations, they get more enjoyment, I'm told, from actually talking and planning it than the actual vacation. I used to say, well, then let's just talk about it. We don't actually we don't have to take it. It doesn't work that way because then there's no enjoyment. Time. But anyway, I mean, it's so fascinating to me how different we are with one another, and yet how important it is to have meaningful conversation. Now, I'm going to just say this as simply as I can. Communication is like water to Ivy, to my marriage. You can't say, I'm only going to give you so much. You have to find out how much is needed. And every woman is unique. But the average woman and the average marriage, and this is important for both males and females, and remember, guys, it actually helps us become healthier and live longer, the better we get at this. The average home needs, are you ready for this? About an hour a day in meaningful conversation to get the proper amount of water in your home. How do you like that, guys? An hour a day. Some of you guys are thinking, an hour a day. <laughs> I'm actually here hearing this, and my wife is hearing this. Hey, it doesn't have to be an hour at a time. Yeah, go ahead, put your hands over her ears. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't have to be an hour at a time. It can be five minutes here, 10 minutes there, 15 minutes over here, half hour over there, whatever. Here's what my wife and I used to do when I was a graduate student and busy as can be. We had every Friday night, our kids were a little tiny, every Friday night was date night. We knew that we were going to go somewhere at 7 and whatever it took. And so she would hold things, hold things, hold things, and then we just talked about whatever. And if we went to 1, 2 in the morning, we filled up our plant on Friday night because I just didn't have the time. I mean, I was studying all the time or in class, working part-time to put myself through graduate school. It just wasn't practical, so we figured it out. And it was very, very um, acceptable to both of us. We worked it out because it was unique in our home. You can work it out whatever you want. We had one accountant in one of our groups in fact, we used to tell our, our, our couples we worked with, you need to spend at least starting off a half hour a day, every day. So just set a time. And, and one of our accountant guys in our group actually used to set the timer on the clock, you know, and because uh, that's part of the skill. You say, come on, come on, let's talk. You know, something's coming on in a few moments. See, that's part of the skill. They can't say anything then. So it's, not, it's a matter of learning how to warm up in a conversation, how to close it down, how to close the conversation instead of just leaving it open and never solving anything. All those things come into the knowledge of learning how to communicate. If you want the best kind of marriage and you're committed to it, you, we have to learn how to communicate. And it needs to be meaningful communication. Otherwise, couples get to the place where they get so strained out. You heard about the couple where they were, uh, uh, actually, he initiated it. He says, you know what? We never talk anymore. They're at the kitchen table. We never talk anymore for breakfast. We hardly do anything together anymore. You never get up anymore and make, a, a, you know, breakfast for the family. You ever make me a hot meal? Why is that? They were strained. And she looked across the table and she said, Dear, if you want a hot meal, light your cornflakes on fire. Now, anytime a couple, anytime a couple gets that strained out, then you know there are a number of things that are missing. 
right? Well, see, those are only reflections that something's missing somewhere. It can either be insecurity, other factors we're going to get with. In fact, our third area, it could be a direct violation of the third area that we'll talk about in our conference here. Conversation. Watch it not happen if things aren't going right in your home. Make sure it happens if you want the best kind of marriage. Now, at this point, I'd like to say some really serious things and very special things just to the women. And um, I'd like to say it in such a way that sounds honoring, and yet I have to be honest with you. And, and I have to be uh, truthful in the sense that this is one thing women do. In fact, it's really part of the two things you do that discourage us. See, the average male would like to have a good marriage if we knew what to do. But what you do something to us that discourages us sometimes so much, we don't even have any energy to work on it. And yet you want that marriage. Now, this is the kind of thing you do to us. Do you know that the average woman can make 250,000 facial expressions? You think of that. 250,000 facial expressions. And that's part of our meaningful communication is facial expressions. Now, here's the kind of thing you do. And you'll use your facial expressions in your body language when you do this. This is the typical kind of thing you're capable of doing. This is what discourages us. Sometimes you'll have your hand here, and you say it any way you want. But you're capable of saying something like this. <sighs> when are you going to get with the program? <laughs> See, now the average man doesn't know what the program is, first of all. <laughs> and you think we know what it is because you see it. We don't see it, OK? Now, when you tell us to get with the program, Oftentimes, we will do something because maybe we'll see tears or whatever else, and then you're capable of saying, is that your best shot? Do you think that'll work? Do you think that'll help? Well, forget it, buddy. That's not going to do anything at all. What you've just done, in essence, is cut us off of the knees because what you've asked us to do is something we don't know what to do. We didn't know it was needed. We thought it was fine that we just came home, you know, every night. And uh, why can't we just work this out kind of thing? We didn't understand what you were really looking for, security, conversation, those kinds of things. So what you do to us is you make us feel, and this is one of the greatest needs of a man, you make us feel inadequate by your facial expressions, your tone of voice, your body language, by what you say to us. And we really feel like we're out to lunch a lot of times because of your looks. And we, do you know that women literally intimidate men? Uh, UCLA does a study every year, does it over and over again. They have discovered that women basically intimidate us. You make us uncomfortable. You make us nervous. I, one of the reasons that we know you know something, we don't know exactly what it is that you know. But <laughs> the problem is that you think we know that is a problem right there. See, if you could look at us as a woman and assume that we speak a foreign language, we'd be a lot better off. <laughs> because we really do. We speak a left brain language that, that we don't understand why you don't understand us and so on and so forth. And uh, if you could look at us and say, my husband is a person that doesn't understand what I'm saying and learn the language that we understand, and that's the fourth session we get into, we'll teach you a language system that you can use anytime you want with us. And again, you'll understand it, we'll understand it, and we'll feel your feelings, which is exactly what we need in meaningful communication. So it bridges the foreign language gap that we have as a couple. Otherwise, let's pretend that, and I like to have the women vote on this one too, but let's pretend that, that uh, you came early tonight. What's your first name is? Christine. Christine? Christine. Okay. Uh, let's pretend you came early tonight and there were some chairs that were goofed up, there were papers all over, and I knew you were all coming here in a few minutes. So I come over here and I say, hey, listen, can you give me a, a hand? You know, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. And we introduce ourselves, you can tell me your name. And, and, uh, uh, could you help me pick up some of these papers? Because And some of these plants are goofed. I don't know who goofed this thing up, but I could sure use your help because everybody's going to be here in a few moments. And so she just looks at me and smiles like, great, I got help. So I'm over here helping the chairs and pick, and she just sits there. So I think, wait a minute. So I come back over here and I say, uh, excuse me, I was just wondering, uh, Kristen, I was just wondering, is there any way you give me a hand? You said you would, you know, you're smiling. I could sure use your help because all these people will be here any minute. And, and maybe you're not into chairs and papers. Maybe you'd like to take the stage and I'll take the other things. I could choose you. What do you think, okay? Look at her. She's smiling at me, okay? <laughs> now I'm hacked because she's not helping me. So now I come over here and I say, hey, this really bugs me. Something <laughs> wrong with you or something, woman? <laughs> you understand what's going on here? Can't you give me a hand? She's smiling. Can you believe she's smiling? Let's pretend this. Let's pretend that she only spoke Spanish. 
and I only spoke English. But I didn't know she only spoke Spanish. I like to have the women vote. How many of you women would think we'd be pretty insensitive of me to get angry, all upset, everything else, because she can't speak my language? Because I don't know that. But how many of you think, yeah, if you get really on her case, that's pretty insensitive, that's unfair, that's, that's not right, that's wrong to get on her case because she can't speak your language. Let's see you vote. It looks like 99%. Um, that's exactly what you do to us or can do to us on a regular basis. See, because you look at us like, I can't believe you aren't getting with this thing. And we don't know what you're saying because you're speaking a foreign language. We don't speak of your language, is basically what it is. <laughs> so you know what we need? We need, one of our greatest needs is the feeling adequate and receiving praise. If you want to really meet our need as a man, Start noticing when we are doing any one of these four or any other thing we talk about here or any book you're reading on relationships or whatever else, start noticing when we do any amount of it and start praising us for it. And reduce your criticism down to nothing for a while unless we come to you and say, please criticize us, which very few of us do. Uh, <clears throat> but start looking for ways of making us feel adequate one of the greatest things i have in my life ladies and gentlemen is a wife who believes in me a woman you know everything i'm doing this all this stuff all of my books everything else i have a wife behind me who says you could do it i'll help you do it i know you can do it i believe in you because a lot of times i'm like i can't do that i can't do that. i don't think i could do that i'd probably fail at that she says hey even if you did we could we got it down because you'll get it down we could do it she believes in me i love it and she makes me feel adequate as a man, as a person, as a husband, as a worker. Men, we gain our identity through our job. When a woman learns about what we do and praises us for what we do and looks for even ways of helping us do it better, whatever we do, then there's a woman behind us that knows and understands the deepest need of a man because we're very sensitive to praise and we're very alert to dishonor and feeling inadequate. You know one of the key factors in affairs is a man leaving a home, feeling inadequate at home. And, and, it, and it may be valid. I mean, maybe he doesn't understand what to do, and he's not loving her like he should, but he doesn't know exactly what to do. And he goes to work and, and meets a woman at work that's blinking at him and, and making him feel what? Adequate. In such an unreal world, in an unreal situation usually, in a lot of pain involved in an affair. But part of it, and I'm not saying this is the only reason, there's a lot of reasons, but this can be a factor. It's much better for a wife to be at home looking for ways to make a decision going, oh, I'm married to this awesome person. And we can learn it. Have you ever heard of the studies, you know, and I know it's kind of like psychology 101 kind of thing in college where they taught you the power of praise. Remember those studies where we used to, we used to uh, like I did with my niece when she was a little girl, I had her make up 100 sentences, and every time she used the pronoun, six pronouns, but 100 sentences, every time she used one particular pronoun, he or whatever it was, I would give her nonverbal reinforcement like, ah, or hmm, or ha. Ah. Every time she used one of the others, I leaned back and looked bored, you know, kind of doodle or whatever. Anytime she didn't use the right pronoun, I'd show negative reinforcement. Every time she'd use the pause, the kind of pronoun I wanted, then I'd get, my eyes would light up. See, eyes lighting up and mouth dropping is double honor. See? And so it reinforces. Before the 50th sentence was up, she was using every sentence with he, he did this, he did that, and so on. And after the study was over, I said, what do you think I was doing? She had no idea. Because it's the power of nonverbal. Literally, a psychology class at a university got together away from the professor and decided that every time he got close to the hot water radiators in a Midwest school, they were going to get excited about his lecture. They were going to take notes no matter what he said. They were going to say, oh, you know, kind of thing. And the further away he got away from the radiator, then they were going to look bored and go, oh, look at their watch. Go, oh, okay. <laughs> Within three weeks, they had him seated on the hot water radiator. <laughs> That's the power of praise. Now, every woman knows what I'm talking about. Every man knows what I'm talking about because that's what we do with our kids, that we do with our friends. <gasps> we get people to talk about things by our facial expressions. If we're not interested, we look away. 
And people sense, I don't, they're not interested. I guess I can't talk about that subject. We do it all the time naturally without even realizing. Let's use the power. How can we do this? When your husband starts to do one of these four things, even starts, let's say, zero to ten. Let's say he's at a one or a two. Go like this. Here it comes. Here it comes. It's coming. And we'll know we're doing something right. We won't know exactly what it is. But we'll know that it must be right. We love praise. So do you. Our children do. Look for the things we're doing that's heading us in the right direction. Stop criticizing the areas where we're failing. Because all you're doing is discouraging us. And again, unless we're asking for it. And there are a lot of times, ladies and gentlemen, that I go to my family and ask, how can I improve? And we've done it so much as a family that anybody loves doing that? Do you love going to, say, to somebody and going, hey, help me improve. I can hardly wait to be criticized. How many are into being criticized? Let me see. There's no hand up. Nobody likes to be criticized. I make a left brain decision to be criticized because wise people seek correction. Look at every successful company, people that have the evaluation forms, all that. That's criticism. It's not easy, but the more I do it, the easier it gets. So, our greatest need is adequacy and being praised. You can give that to us, believe in us, help us. Say to her the kinds of things my wife says. I know you didn't realize when you said that to Carrie how deeply that hurt her. I know you didn't realize it because as a man, we all love you. We love you as, as dad, as whatever. But let me share with you what that did to Carrie. I can receive it then because it's, it's couched in praise. But to just blast away at me, I avoid. Big problem. First area, security. Second area, meaningful conversation. Third area, romantic Emotional experiences on a regular basis. What is that? That's candlelight dinners once in a while. That's a walk just barefoot or with your shoes or whatever around the block by a beach, uh, by a river, holding hands, just talking for a half hour. It's uh, driving up to a uh, you know, weekend uh, in the mountains in a cabin. It's uh, whatever that's meaningful, romantic, and emotional for you because every couple is going to be a little unique. Now, there's actual things that we are capable of doing to wrecking the whole thing, even though we think it's going to be meaningful. One time in California, I, I, I had couples discuss this, and I said, uh, give me some examples. So the couples raised their hand, you know. One woman said, yeah, walk at night down by the beach, you know, holding hand, just as the sun is setting. I love that. It's romantic to me. And, and he said, hey, that's great. And then I said to her, is there anything he could do that would wreck that experience? And she said, yes, if he brought his fishing pole along. Now, for a man, it's no big deal. It's way down here. It's not bothering anything. But we'll hold hands. She doesn't even see it. But just having your hand can wreck it. Well, we're down there anyway. We can throw in on the pier, you know, as soon as we're done, you know, kind of thing. But I never would have known that. See, this is why it's important to refine the knowledge and the skills. And you just spend the rest of your life refining and refining. You get better and better and better at it. In fact, uh, <clears throat> what we can do in a little while, and this is in your supplement, you actually meet as a couple or singles with your friends and actually discuss what would be, zero to ten, a romantic, emotional experience that to you um, would be something really special. Now, it's both males and females. And then as you hear both persons something close to a ten, something really special, then you see if you can combine both of yours into one activity, whatever it is. You can do that. And just take your manual, sit down, your supplement, go through it, ask those kinds of questions, and you'll refine and refine. And before our year is up, you'll have 20 things you've learned that are really special for everyone in the family. Because if you leave that out, it's like leaving the soil. It's like leaving the roots bare. Ivy starts browning out. So romantic, emotional experience. So security, meaningful conversation, romantic, emotional experiences, four. Physical needs. What is the main physical need in a home? Touch. Holding hands. Touching on the arm. Touching the shoulder. Touch. You know that 80%, the research is showing that around 80%, give or take, what, 5 or 10%, 80% of a woman's need is non-sexual. What her physical need is is to be held. Um, touched in a meaningful way. Uh, not so true with the male. 
Uh, men are testosterone loaded. We have a chemical flowing through our body that's called testosterone. Paint a big T right on your husband's t-shirt. Because tost and with teenagers, it's flowing through their body. What testosterone does is it drives us sexually. It causes us to have a sexual thought and the average male American has a sexual thought every so many seconds, you know, like 40, 50 seconds kinds of thing. And uh, I'm sure that's not true of the guys in this room, but uh, <laughs> in the typical male. And part of the reason is just because of the testosterone flowing through our body. We're basically turned on most of the time. Sexually speaking, males are sort of like um, microwave ovens, sexually. Women are more like crock pots, sexually. <laughs> they, uh, a woman tends to, yes. A woman tends to warm up to the sexual experience. See, sexual enjoyment and fulfillment for a woman has to be security, conversation, and romance first, and then physical sexual response. See, if you have a woman in your home that is not sexually responsive, something's missing, one of the other three, or all of the other three, because they tend not to be able to respond. Remember we said the difference between a woman and a man, objective and personal? See, the sexual experience for a, man, a woman has to be personal. It doesn't have to be for a man. Why do you think that you never read in the paper about a woman raping a man? She doesn't know those guys. She doesn't have a relationship with them. And she's not testosterone loaded. So why would she want to? And literally, I have, I have gotten reports from people that I've counseled where they're like in their 60s and 70s, where a woman, I mean, in one situation, she had a kidney problem, and the doctor was prescribing the male hormone testosterone for part of her cure. Well, he went back to the doctor after a month and said, Doc, I don't know what you're giving my wife, but we're too old for all this. <laughs> See, that's the male, that's a steroid. See, you can't, it turns, you can't buy this, guys, at the drugstore because it ruins a woman physically. See, it messes with her. Voice gets deeper. She starts growing hair. She starts out arm wrestling you. It does a lot of damage to her body, so you can't buy it. Well, you don't have to buy it because a woman tends to respond sexually to a good relationship. And if it isn't happening in your home, immediately as a male, let me just warn you, probably something's haywire and weakened in the relationship. Either the sunlight, the water, or the soil is weak. Get those three things strong and watch what happens sexually, physically. See, that's why males with testosterone flowing through our body, at 10 o'clock at night, we can get into bed. Nothing happened relationally, basically security and all those other things. We're capable of tapping you on the shoulder and saying, what do you think? And uh, <laughs> see, the average woman goes, what do I think? <laughs> she doesn't even know where we're coming from kind of thing. See, she says when she has a headache or it's the wrong year or, uh, <laughs> see, I mean, it, the bottom line is, guys, there has to be a good relationship or that area is weak. So to conclude this, great strength of a woman her ability to develop and sense good relationships. And we can draw that right out of her. Strength of a male, we make a decision to do this because it's right. It builds strength into our home. We can do it when we have a plan. And, we, and, we, and this is part of that plan. This is not everything, but these have got to be included, these four. Security, conversation, romance, and physical. Remember, 20% or 80% of her need is just to be held. Meaningful touch. I told this one time to an audience, and um, a guy decided to do this on a regular basis. Eight to 12 meaningful touches a day is required by women to maintain their normal need balance and emotional balance and touch. Eight to 12 a day. And I've seen men reach over to their wife and go, oh, great, because this, this can reduce our medical bills, actually. So when that man hears this, he goes, one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> that may not be meaningful. One guy told me in my seminar, he tried this. He said he, he hadn't gotten to his 12 this one day, and he was actually it's off the wall, but he was in the shower, and he was, forgot a towel. He was jumping across the hall to go to get a towel. And when he jumped across the hall, dripping wet, he noticed his wife down in the other room doing something, he said, I'm going to give her one of the Meaningful 12 in a surprise. So he runs down to the kitchen, throws his arms around to give her a meaningful hug, surprises her, and the neighbor lady was sitting right there at the end. <laughs> so you can't always, you know, give the, the 12 meaningful uh, touches a day. So anyway, the point is that, that we need to make a decision to strengthen our homes, strengthen our relationship with our children, and that's possible. And, and oh, this is another real important thing. I've got to conclude with this. 
ladies, you cannot do this to us. And I know what happens. Do not say to us, well, you don't feel it, so forget it. I know you don't mean it, so just forget the whole thing. You've been to that smally thing. I can tell you don't feel it. You see, you know why you can't say that to us? Because men do things first and then feel it second. You do things because you feel it first. If you tell us we have to feel it first, we can't do it. We stop. We're dead. We can't do it. We feel real inadequate that you're asking us to do something we don't tend to do. It's so again, you see, valuing the differences. And when we do something, you say to us, boy, I'm so grateful you're doing this. And I know it's hard for you to do some of these things because sometimes you don't feel it. But I appreciate it so much that you do it. Boy, do we eat that up. We go, that's okay, anytime. <laughs> so that's important. Now, so what we've done so far, we've talked about honor. Oh, <gasps> Stradivarius-ism, okay? Then we've talked about love. And love is finding the facts necessary to build a good marriage. And provide those facts, whatever it takes. Third, what we're going to do is talk about the number one way I find couples dishonoring each other. And it leads into disharmony. And it causes more havoc in the average home than any other factor I know of. And it's so simple once we understand it and uh, apply it. So we'll be back in a moment, and we'll share the third area. You know, before we review this session, let me mention that the next video in this series is crucial in building and maintaining loving relationships. I'm going to show you the absolute greatest destroyer of any relationship, and which we're all experiencing to some degree every day. I'll show you how you can detect this destructive area at any time because most of us do not realize the damage it can cause. And I'll show you how to keep it out of all of your relationships on a daily basis. This one area can not only destroy your relationships, but just listen to what it can do to you personally and to your loved ones. Now, it can weaken your immune system. It instantly builds emotional walls between people. It lowers our self-esteem. It is one of the biggest factors that can even hinder our attempts to believe in God. And it can increase deep resistance within children towards their parents. Now, these are just a few of the negative areas that this next video explains. But more importantly, we show you how you can detect this enemy and keep it out of all of your relationships. Okay, let's just review a few of the points from this current video. Now, remember we talked about four essential elements security, meaningful communication, emotional bonding, meaningful touch. Now, each of those areas are vitally important in every healthy relationship. But to bring it right down to earth and to make it practical, part of what we do is we talk to each other about what makes it more alive and uh, meaningful. Like security. What makes you feel insecure? Talk about that. What do you need to do to make your mate or friend feel secure or more secure? Something close to a 10. Like, for example, how often do you need to hear that you're loved? Uh, how, do, uh, how do you feel when you get a card in the mail or you get flowers or a special gift or a special meal has been pre prepared? Or, or let's say that uh, the house is decorated in a certain way to really communicate that you are extremely valuable. I mean, you have to talk about what it is that makes you feel secure. Okay, then let's go to meaningful communication. Well, you have to discuss what is meaningful communication to each other. I mean, it might be something different to the male, something different to the female, something different to friends, but you can talk about it. If we talk about this, I love that because that's meaningful to me. The other person said, well, that's not meaningful to me, but I love to talk about this. And then it's where you talk and it's when you talk. All of those things can actually be written down and discussed, even in a short paragraph, so that we're refining it. And I want to mention that the fourth video that we have gives you a communication method that you can say whatever you want and your mate or your friend instantly understands you and literally feels your feelings. Now, I know that's hard to believe, but you'll see it happen when you get the fourth video. Also, 
in one of the future videos, we have a whole session just on the seven different types of communication methods. And so you can get deep into this area and, uh, and see it enriched in your life because communication is sort of like uh, the foundation to a home. If it's solid, then as you start to build the other areas of your relationship on top of that foundation, then the whole thing remains solid. Well, let's move to emotional bonding. Well, when are you going to have your next activity? And is that activity meaningful to you and each person in the home or with your friends? Uh, everyone needs to anticipate that they're going to enjoy this time together. If they don't, then you have resistance and you're not emotionally bonded like you could be. So discuss when's the next time we're going to do something and what would, what would it take to have it really meaningful for each person that's trying to be emotionally bonded. And then last but not least, and that's meaningful touch. What a rich area. I mean, how often do you need to be hugged? Uh, what kind of touching do you appreciate? There may be some things you're doing to each other in touch that you don't appreciate. It turns you off. It's not meaningful. It's actually offensive. Well, unless you talk about it, interact on it, maybe write it down, uh, what would it take to have a 10 relationship in the area of touch? See, this is so simple but so profoundly uh, practical because you can design the kind of relationship in these four elements where you then are confident that you're going to have a great relationship. And I encourage you to practice these things because I'm telling you, they will work and you will experience a better relationship than maybe you ever dreamed possible.